Good evening. Good evening. This time is for real. <laughs> I'm Tracy Kramer. I'm the Southeast Regional Outreach Coordinator for National Parks Conservation Association. And we in the Renova House are so happy to see you. Uh, and tonight's going to be really special. And I just can't wait for you to see it. But uh, before we get started, I want to uh, acknowledge the museum for being a tremendous partner. Uh, Sarah Smith, Phil Archer, Stephen Drogesic, uh, Dan and Russo, they have been my partners in this wonderful planning and logistics uh, extravaganza, it feels like at this point. Um, and all the rest of the staff too, they have some wonderful docents, the security folks, everyone here has just been fabulous. David Lantrum and Phil Archer are our presenters tonight. After the program, I think you're going to just see the world with a whole new eye. We also have to mention the lady who brought us together. I'm not sure if she's here, but Deb Lazenby, who does community relations and outreach for Mass General Store, heard about this exhibit, told the museum folks, you should talk to NPCA. And I bet the first question was, NPCA? <laughs> So who is that? Well, we're the advocacy organization for the National Park System. We're a membership organization, and as you may have heard, it's the centennial of the National Parks System. They are 100. The official birthday is August 25th. And it's a big deal. There aren't many centenarians out there, and the vision of the National Park System uh, was such a phenomenal thing. And one of the reasons that we want to honor Ansel Adams is that he was instrumental in framing how people saw the majestic national parks of the West. Many people know these parks that have never been there because his images are so profound and moving and striking in many ways. When we first had the conversation of, gee, we're doing this exhibit, and how could NBCA and Renolda House get together and do something special? She told me, she said, there was an article in his last interview in 1984 before he died, and he said, every day I feel I need to do something to support the environment. And so Adams was a special man. And we're trying to sort of fire up this idea of speaking up for national parks. Find your voice to support and protect America's best idea. For the centennial, the National Park System has a program called, or a campaign, called Find Your Park. NPCA, which by the way, we're a membership organization. We are like the AARP. For national parks. <laughs> so that means we advocate for better funding, we help protect clean air, clean water, well we're protecting against dirty air and dirty water, uh, habitat and wildlife, landscape conservation, all the things that make national parks special that are unique and repositories of the biodiversity and the landscapes and the history and our culture the American story. These are your national parks. And we hope that after tonight we'll be even more fired up to go visit a park, take a friend, come back to the exhibit, uh, donate to organizations that are working on conservation and environment, become a member of NPCA, get out there and make a difference. Because if we don't protect them, they won't be there for our future generations. So we're going to show you a little video that might spur you to take a trip. I will put one foot in front of the other until I can't take another step. 
And if I reach the end of the world, I'll jump right in. I will learn the stories of our history's silent heroes. I will stare into a campfire and think about nothing and everything. I'll forget about time and live with the rhythms of the sky. And then I'll be reminded of the vastness of time. I will crane my neck to look up trees and lower my gaze to peer into canyons. I will go places I've never been and I'll return to my favorite places again and again and again. I will feel the heat of the desert sun and the chill of the glacier beneath my feet. I will invite my friends and family to join me and I will go entirely on my own. I will take pictures of arches and mosses and dunes and then I'll put down the camera and appreciate the things that cannot be captured. Like how the simplest of snacks can taste like a five-star meal. I will abandon the GPS and plan my adventure with nothing but a paper map and a wooden sign to guide my way. And if I get lost, that's just fine. I'll get found again. I will reach new heights and new depths. I'll travel by bus, by boat, by pedal, and by pod. And I'll leave no trace. In fact, I'll leave it better than I found it. Because I know that if I take the steps to protect our parks, they will always be there for both me and those who will follow. The perfect place to put one foot in front of the other. She certainly fired me up to go see Yosemite and sort of commune a little bit with Ansel Adams. 
for the exhibition. And the Nolma House has arranged this exhibition, obviously very conscientiously, with the centennial of the Park Service in mind. And one of our goals was to give visitors a, a greater appreciation for the pivotal role that photography played in creating the national parks. So, um, as, as Tracy said, this has been called America's greatest contribution to democracy in the world. The idea that we have set aside special lands for the uh, Commonwealth. Um, but photography has played a very central role in that, and it's allowed us perhaps more than any other in preserving wild places. Uh, we so appreciate the Na National Arts Conservation Association becoming a national outreach partner. Already, this exhibition is breaking every record that the museum has in terms of visitation. <laughs> We've always had large festivals on the grounds, but I've never seen a, a festival in which people wait at the door of the gallery and a line begins that goes all the way out into the front lawn for people to, to actually see original works of art themselves. Works that they had known much of their lives, but hadn't seen in this sort of exhibition. Personally, um, I was conditioned, like many other Americans and non-Americans, to, to feel what I did feel actually coming into the, the valleys and climbing up to these waterfalls of Yosemite. It wasn't a feeling that I was late to the party, it was a feeling that the photographs had prompted me and prepared me to have access to the kinds of feelings and the kinds of uh, awe that Ansel Adams felt. A writer in Time Magazine, and by the way, I'll try to mention everything that I'm going to show you is next door. Um, it feels like a little bit of a cold invitation to be showing you projections on the real works of next door. Uh, but uh, I will show a few next to that are not in the exhibition. I'll try to point that out. But you'll get to see all of these momentarily. Uh, a writer in Time Magazine wrote in 1951, quote, No artist has pictured the magnificence of the Western states more eloquently. This year, he wrote, Thousands and thousands of tourists will follow Ansel Adams' well-beaten trail up and down the national parks, fixing the cold eyes of their cameras on the same splendors he has photographed. The same really can be written 65 years later of people in 2016. And I think that's worth pondering for a moment, how lasting has been Ansel Adams' hold over our aesthetic imagination when it comes to wild places. It's hard to think of any other artist so, so holding the public imagination of a type of landscape. That writer called Ansel Adams' trail well beaten, and it was not completely virgin when Ansel Adams first walked himself. There were photographers that came before him, and I'll share a couple of their uh, stories with you. In Ansel Adams' early ventures, here he is, they think, about age 18 or 19. Um, his burrow, mistletoe, we see uh, at right, carried around 100 pounds of gear and food. Ansel Adams was himself carried about a 30 pound pack of photographic equipment. Adams was heir to a long tradition of American wilderness photographers who lugged cameras, tripods, and even portable dark rooms with them into the backcountry in order to capture its breathtaking beauty. The first one I'll uh, share with you is Carlton Watkins. Watkins uh, was not trained in art or photography, but he took a job as a young man at one of the very first photo studios in California. And the studio showed the first photographs made in Yosemite. This is 1859, incredibly early. Watkins um, may not have known much about photography, but he had a sense for uh, what, might, what might sell, and what might create awe for these landscapes, these 3,000 foot tall granite features. So he had an 18 by 22 inch format camera built for him to be able to go into Yosemite and take larger format photographs. It was a really enterprising idea. His expeditions required a dozen mules to carry all of the equipment 50 miles from the end of the road. The road ended at Mariposa, and he had his, his uh, caravan of mules had to make the additional 50 miles. I imagine that every glass plate weighed four pounds. And at this point, they were working in wet clothing. So there's a wet um, substance that's put on the glass plate and the photograph has to be developed within minutes afterwards. So this equipment and the dark room are all being carried up and down these mountains. This is his, his image of El Capitan. This year was 1860, and at this point homesteaders were moving in huge numbers into the Yosemite Valley. 
I read that there was one huckster who set up a lottery to raffle off land titles to land that he didn't even own. <laughs> um, so in response to this uh, rapid influx of homesteaders, there was a group that, set, uh, that was arranged to safeguard this valley and safeguard the Maricosa Road. One member of that group was Frederick Law Olmsted, the landscape architect responsible for Central Park and the Biltmore Estate, among many other places, and whose protege is actually responsible for the design of Granola. Olmsted was then managing a large tract of land near Maricosa Road, and he was distraught to see that California was populated, quote, almost entirely by thriftless, fortune-hunting, improvident, gambling vagabonds. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dave, we had at least one California. <laughs> This is a long time ago. This group uh, collected some of Carlton Watkins' photographs, sent them to Senator John Connus of California. Connus took the portfolio photographs to Washington, shared them with his uh, fellow members of Congress, and in 1864, President Abraham Lincoln signed a bill declaring that Yosemite, quote, shall be held for public use, resort, and recreation, and shall be inalienable for all time. This was the first such action, I'll stress, made in any nation in history. 1864 is, of course, uh, seeing some of the worst of the Civil War, so the federal government did not actually take on management of the park, but it's assigned that to the state of California. So it's the first set-aside park, but until 1890, it was actually a California state park. Uh, the second photographer uh, I'll introduce you to, uh, maybe a familiar name already, is William Henry Jackson. Jackson was hired as a photographer really more uh, for the scientific uses to which photography could be put. He was part of a geological expedition to the Wyoming Territory. This is a few years later, 1871. Um, Jackson's photographs were meant to document the natural marvels of Yellowstone, um, but they would be essential to the creation in 1872 of the first truly national park at Yellowstone with two million acres. At this point, there weren't rail lines into this part of the Wyoming territories, so the logging interests didn't yet have a sort of hole in the area, and it was possible to create a national park really before the logging and the rail lines entered the, the, the area. Uh, his role was ostensibly scientific to document the ge incredible geology and the geothermal phenomena like the geysers, but there's no question that he had an incredible artistic eye and that um, the works appeal to the emotions, that then and now, emotions play a huge role in terms of what gets conserved. Later he made astonishing, these are photo, uh, polychrome photographs of Yosemite. I think you want to sit up straight over your chair. <laughs> and these are in the, the Library of Congress collection and can be seen online. Landscape uh, painters like Albert Bierstadt, this is the Sierra Nevada painting, which you may know from the Ronald House collection. They were very successful, very, very famous in the 1860s, 70s. They contributed to a national awareness of the importance of Western sites. The Southern Pacific and Santa Fe Railroads actually commissioned artists like Beerstadt to represent and glorify Western scenery in order to encourage tourism. But the veracity of the paintings was doubted by people who had not themselves traveled West. And there was some justification for this doubt since Bierstadt freely combined elements that he sketched in the field and then assembled in his studio into idealized, somewhat imaginative landscapes. Um, Alice Slade remarked in the tour today for the NPCA, there's no trace of visible rail lines in these paintings. Uh, miles of, of rail lines have been blasted through the Sierra, but that doesn't make any appearance in these idealized paintings. And public skepticism was kindled at this time by exaggerations about the marvels of the western back and beyond. Tall tales of tornadoes picking up entire towns and moving them. Mm -hmm. Lumberjacks in, like Paul Bunyan, creating big rock candy mountains out of nothing. Bears rising to the height of 15 feet. So there's a lot of skepticism about tales of the west. The photographs of this first generation of western photographers, as astonishing as they were, are took of the art of the real rather than the art of the ideal. And these uh, were believed by the public at large because they were photographed. They thus became instrumental for conservation as well as beautiful objects in themselves. And this is the third photographer I want to mention from that first generation, Timothy O'Sullivan. O'Sullivan worked as a young boy, a preteen, in the studio of Matthew Brady. So he cut his teeth in the battlefields and the aftermath of the battlefields of the Civil War. 
And just after the war, traveled west with another scientific expedition. This one was the Clarence King expedition that traveled the 40th parallel and explored areas above and below the 40th parallel in the Wyoming Territory, Colorado, Utah. In the 1970s, a group of photographers undertook a re-photographic survey project, returning to the exact locations of this expedition and some other expeditions. They mathematically found a precisely identical vantage point where Osama and other photographers were standing. And it accomplished a number of things. First of all, um, of course, these were quantifiable facts as photographs, and they had that scientific uh, purpose. But they also, um, through this re-photographic process, elevated our sense of the artistry involved. How do these supposedly objective scientific photographs express the personal style of the photographer? Well, in this re-photograph, as you see with the rectangle on the right, the one at the left is O'Sullivan's original photograph in 1969. The one that on the right was re-photographed over a century later. And you see in that frame that O'Sullivan made a decision at some point to either adjust the angle of his camera or adjust his print, print process in order to create something that seemed aesthetically right to him and represented the witch's rocks. So this process in the late 70s elevated um, and brought to fame some of these pretty unknown photographers. The first biography of O'Sullivan um, that, I, that I read was called America's Forgotten Photographer, at least forgotten no longer. Um, and there were major exhibitions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Museum of Modern Art. Again, in each one I show, the image at left will be from the 1870s, and the one at right from the 1970s. The re-photography performs an act of revival, because it, they ask us to think about the photographer's actual standpoint, deciding to be on this bluff, or on this berm of, of, of grass. It makes us think about how hot or cold the photographer was, how probably oxygen deprived, um, and how weighed down by their equipment. It was proved through this exercise that at least one photographer, Edward Moybridge, was suspended by rope into a cavern, into a ravine, in order to get the angle that he wanted. Okay, imagine that with a large format, heavy camera. In Death Valley, an area that David knows well, um, Timothy O'Sullivan worked under conditions so hot that his photographic liquids boiled, reached the boiling point. So here we see his portable dark room. And portable dark rooms, as I mentioned, were necessary because of the wet collodion process. Repeat photography has served a new purpose since the late 1970s, and many of these examples can be seen on the U.S. Geological Survey website and they demonstrate the loss of glacial mass in many locations around the world. Um, conspiracy theories naturally abound <laughs> about these photographs, but um, NASA and the USGS has um, assembled a, a great many of them, and the, word, the pictures say more than a thousand words in terms of the clear loss of glacial mass. In this case, um, Muir Inlet in Glacier Bay. So this is from only from 1941 to 2004. So the lifetime of, of some of us in the room. I saw this uh, at the Yosemite Visitor, Visitor Center in the fall, another USGS comparison, which demonstrates that the last remaining glacier in Yosemite, in the Yosemite Valley, the Lyell Glacier, is technically no longer a glacier because one of the criteria for glaciers is that they be moving, and the Lyell Glacier is not moving any longer, it's simply melting. The re-photography, it's almost like the old stereographs, where you take the two cameras side by side, and then when seen through the lens finder, it creates a three-dimensional view, if you remember the, the old stereograph tools. Um, but these are stereographs in which something is not quite, not, not quite right, something is amiss. As here, these uh, sandstone formations, the middle one, through erosion or through vandalism of some kind, has been knocked down. It's sort of like a deja vu uh, seeing these side by side. Scientists tell us that we get a vu when signals enter our, our temporal lobe with a split second uh, difference between the two signals entering. So one comes from the left hemisphere, one from the right, and the temporal lobe tries to synchronize them. And if there's a split second difference, the second sent signal feels like an old memory. It's a memory rather than a simultaneous experience. And these are sort of uh, deja vu stereographs with a century in between the two. In some cases, things disappear um, and 
show a re reversal of fortune. So near Virginia City, the ma massive mining operations disappeared as everything of value was extracted from the land. And so the image on the right is a contemporary image. But in more, more cases, um, they demonstrate the incursion of human development. So either through the interstate park uh, highway system or highways that uh, were created to enter the park system, we see the loss of geological features, like in this case in Echo Canyon, the pulpit rock. You can see the, the small man on top of the pulpit rock, which alas, uh, no longer exists. Happily, even across the 20th century, there were some constants. So this is Old Faithful um, then and in the 1970s. Before uh, bringing Ansel Adams back on stage, I want to have a brief aside. Tracy, David, and I all decided that we needed to introduce at least one of the photographers to whom we're indebted for conservation east of the Mississippi. Everybody else we're looking at is, is west. Um, the marvelous George Massa created images of the Smoky Mountains, uh, working particularly in western North Carolina. The Smokies are the tallest mountains in the Appalachian chain, with the greatest diversity of plant, animal, and insect life in any temperate zone area. Um, according to the Park Service, there are more there's more diversity of trees in the Smokies than there are all of Europe. In the 1910s and 20s, industrial scale logging was expanding deeply into the Smoky Range. Sawmill towns were springing up throughout the hollows. One resident said that the Smokies looked like they'd been skinned. Masahiro Izuka came from Japan to America to study mining. He became an environmentalist, moved to Asheville. That's, it often happens that way. <laughs> um, moved to Asheville, changed his name, Americanized it to Jory Massa, and uh, took a job as a laundry worker in the Grove Park Inn. He fell in love with photography, saved up to buy his own uh, photographic equipment, and he produced postcards like the one on top. At his own expense, he surveyed and mapped areas of the mountains as well as photographing them. When the Great Smoky Mountain Conservation Association was formed, they used uh, his images in a campaign to have the Smoky set aside as a national park. At that point, Acadia in Maine was the only national park east of the Mississippi. In 1926, Congress authorized the national park but didn't provide a penny to pay for it. So the people of Tennessee and North Carolina, um, sort of town by town and hollow by hollow, raised it was going to be a $10 million uh, amount that was required. The, the people raised $5 million. Somebody took George Moss's photograph to John D. Rockefeller, and he matched that. The campaign was a true partnership and advocacy between photographer George Moss and the writer Horace Kephart, whose words accompanied Moss's photographs in brochures and publicity pieces. Kephart died in, in the midst of the campaign in 1931, and uh, Massa organized uh, an expedition, a hike, in Kephart's honor, and came down with influenza. Massa unfortunately died completely penniless after investing everything in this, this campaign for the park. Um, he wanted to be buried next to Kephart, next to the writer, but there were no known relatives to pay for the moving of his, his body, so he was actually buried in Asheville. The following year, 1934, um, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park was officially established by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I have to quote from the Ken Burns documentary on the National Parks because there's a, a happy though bittersweet ending. Within the park, a 6,217 foot peak now bears the official name Mount Kephart. On its broad shoulder is another somewhat shorter peak called Masa Na. So it was a century that transpired between the expeditions of the 1870s and the rephotographic process of the 1970s, that same century uh, measuring our distance from 1916, when the National Park Service was created. It also separates us from the first time Ansel Adams set foot in Yosemite. San Francisco bore Ansel Adams, but Yosemite really raised him, gave him his subject and his cause. This was a fairly Victorian kind of childhood. He was an only child, raised by doting parents and aunts. Uh, it was a very solitary childhood. He was not one to fit in at school. He said they'd gone, what would have been called hyperactive, had I been born in a later generation. His parents took him out of school at the age of 13 and educated him at home, uh, where he took up the study of the piano and briefly uh, had a career as a concert pianist as a young man. So he said that music gave him, this is not in the exhibition, but I have to show it because it's um, very close to where he grew up. 
Music gave his lens the discipline and focus that he said made him successful as a photographer, but it was in nature that he found his home. He roamed um, the bluffs and the woods around the edges of the San Francisco Peninsula. His family home was actually on an, uh, near the dunes just to the west of this view of the Golden Gate. So this is the Golden Gate of San Francisco. It's been said that the 19th century photographers photographed ge geology, and Ansel Adams photographed weather. <laughs> and there's no denying the drama of Adams' skies, but they embody the emotional state that he experienced in these locations. Of his first sight of Yosemite, Adams recalled, quote, in the bright morning we took a grand, dusty, jolting ride in an open motor bus up the deepening, greening gorge to Yosemite. That first impression of the valley was a culmination of experience so intense as to be almost painful. From that day in 1916, my life has been colored and modulated by the great earth gesture of the Sierra. His first job was as caretaker of the Sierra Club Lodge. He became a guide and a, a theater of photographic tours into the park. For several years, he connected the cable that people pulled to climb up the steep face of Half Dome, which had to be reconnected every spring. So he and his wife, Virginia uh, Bess Adams, were both very capable hikers. The subject was the awe that he felt in nature, the humbling exultation of wilderness, whether on a very large scale or a very, very small scale. In the early 1930s, photographers and critics um, criticized Adams, uh, complaining that the world was going to pieces. And here is Ansel Adams photographing rocks. Adams uh, answered this sort of criticism in a letter to Edward Weston, which I quote uh, on the screen. Humanity needs the purely aesthetic just as much as it needs the purely material. Uh, he recognized there was something he was suited to do for humanity. He didn't feel that he could take photographs of red lines or unemployed, unemployment lines, that that wasn't what, what, where his ability lay. He felt that his, his ability was to inspire reverence and gratitude for nature. So at this time, he also became directly active in conservation. The Sierra Club sent him to Washington, D.C. in 1936 to lobby for a King's Canyon. This photograph was made in King's Canyon uh, National Park. He took his portfolio from the House to the Senate and back again, um, met with 40 different members of Congress, told them his own story of finding his life purpose in the parks, and he spoke before a conference of the National Park Service and shared his photographs with Carol Dickens, the Secretary of the Interior. And this was a very important encounter uh, for both men. That particular bill failed in 1936, but Adams assembled the photographs that he brought with him into the book um, that you see here, Sierra Nevada, the John Muir Trail. And he sent a copy of the book to Harold Dickus, who shared it with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Dickus wrote to Adams, I hope that before this session of Congress adjourns, the John Muir National Park in Kings Canyon will be a legal fact. Then we can be sure that your descendants and mine will be able to take as beautiful pictures as you have taken that is provided to have your skill and artistry. Kings Canyon National Park, it's nice to be out of that. <laughs> provides that, uh, provided to have your skill and artistry. Uh, Kings Canyon National Park was created the following year to put um, over a half million acres under protection. The director of the Park Service, Arnold Kammerer, wrote to Adams that a silent and most effective voice in the campaign was your own book on the Sierra Nevada. As long as that book is in existence, it will go on justifying the park. The Department of the Interior next commissioned Adams to photograph national parks for its new headquarters in Washington and for centers at the national parks locations around the country. Adams' series would include Acadia, Olympic, Great Smoky Mountain, Grand Teton, Hawaii Volcanoes, Rocky Mountain, Carlsbad, Glacier Bay, Denali, um, formerly Mount McKinley, and these images are in the exhibition, and Big Ben. His goal was to counter the constant pressures to develop the West by celebrating undisturbed spaces as essential sources of spiritual inspiration. After World War II, Adams' photograph multiplied as posters, books, and postcards, and they set a standard for images in travel magazines, as well as the everyday vacation snapshot. The rapid commercialization of Adams' practice brought attention to these awe-inspiring landscapes, but they simultaneously generated more and more tourists who trampled upon these sites. Adams recognized but, recognized, but reconciled 
um, this contradiction by believing optimistically that reverence for nature can only be cultivated to people who have personal, some personal experience of nature, and that the future of the parks depended upon developing that kind of receptivity and reverence in the voting public. That said, Adams vehemently opposed developments of the golf course skating rink variety um, after the interstate park system was, uh, the interstate highway system rather, was created. He actually advocated for canceling, terminating all concessions in the assembly, including the military <coughs> that he was dependent upon, because he felt that the parks weren't ready for the influx of, of tourists. He later took a little bit more moderate stance on concessions when he felt that the parks had learned how to restrict traffic and force people to travel by bus through the more popular areas. This is not an slide was photographed by Roger Minnick from the Sightseer series. Sightseer series in the 1980s and 90s. So photographing people experiencing the national parks and often trying to capture their own Ansel Adams memento. So we see what the, this woman is seeing at Inspiration Point by reading it on the back of her headscarf. <laughs> I've shown a number of stereographed light images. In this image of um, identical twins at, uh, in Yellowstone, Everything matches from their small watches to the purses to their shoes. The only thing that doesn't match is that only one of the sisters is holding a camera. The sister on the right can trust that the sister on the left will know exactly what to photograph because William Henry Jackson and Ansel Adams have provided a template for her. And Ansel Adams, I think, would have welcomed this duo. He may even have invited them to study with him. From 1940 on, Ansel Adams taught thousands of young photographers, many of them became nature photographers, uh, in workshops in Yosemite. Um, when I first read about this, I remember the Paul Simon Saturday Night Live episode where he goes to purgatory and he find that his purgatory is to ride an elevator and listen to his own music on music. <laughs> <laughs> and, I was like, and I thought, what would that be like to see people doing pale imitations of your great, your greatest hits year after year? But, um, Fear not, as Ansel Adams said. Most people have the idea that there's nothing you can do with a camera in Yosemite except take another postcard snapshot. I remind my workshop participants that the National Parks provide an experience, a mood, an incredible subject for the camera. The fact that it happens to be in a national park and is stimulated by the photographer's feeling that it's a new kind of scene, and this feeling has been possible because Yosemite has been set aside and protected as a national park. But the beauty itself was there even before it became a national park. So this is one way that the parks continue to repay their debt to photography by inspiring new generations. Adams continues committed in later life, as, as Tracy quoted, to doing something each day for the environment, writing to a, a, a member of Congress or speaking to a group. He brought his images and his causes to several US presidents, and he made the only official presidential portrait of the photograph. Any guesses which president this photograph Hans Adams for his official portrait? Yeah. 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 Later. Yeah. Later still. Yeah. It's, it's not fair because I didn't say that he lived until 1984. Johnson. <laughs> Carter, Carter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who also uh, awarded Adams with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So Adams, soon before his death, was on the cover of Time Magazine, so he was the first photographer to ever be recognized uh, on the cover of Time Magazine. And I'd like to leave you with his own words. Art is both love and friendship and understanding, the desire to give. It is not charity, which is the giving of things. It is more than kindness, which is the giving of self. It is both the taking and giving of beauty, the turning out to the light of the inner folds of the awareness of the spirit. I have to say that again. The turning out to the light of the inner folds of the awareness of the spirit. It is the recreation on another plane of the realities of the world, the tragic and wonderful realities of earth and men, and of all the interrelations between you. Oh, please. Thank you very much.
lens impacted so many things in wonderful places. And I like the part where he had to go to 40 legislators and he didn't win. That's the work of conserving the best of America for our future generations. Some of the work that we do takes years. Fighting resource extraction, pollution, development, and finding a balance between commerce and nature is not a small task. It's why our one million members and supporters, they're the choir that we are bringing to our elected officials, and decision makers, to help influence the policy that creates and supports and protects these special places. My colleague, David Landrum, who we imported from the West Coast for this event, uh, has actually just spent eight years of his life influencing policy, building community, cultivating congressional relationships, directing media, and leading advocacy efforts to help establish the 410 National Park Unit. And sometimes people think, 410? I had no idea there were that many. Most times folks think of the 76 National Parks. But if you didn't know it, National Monuments, National Seashores, Civil War Battlefields, there's a lot of different designations within the National Park System, and we love all of them. But David in particular has been very embedded in the California desert, and he's our California Desert Program Manager and our National Wildlife Program Director. So he's a former wildlife biologist, and a self-taught photographer, and a visual artist who draws inspiration from and is fascinated by nature's texture and detail and intricacy, and the interwoven existence that is a result of how all of these things need the others to do well and thrive. He's been published in High Country News, Desert Companion, Wild South, and the North American Nature Photography Associations, Currents Magazine. He led a fellowship in 2008 to establish a program called Tortoises Through the Lens, which you're going to hear a little bit about. And he's also an International League of Conservation Photography uh, fellow, and that is not an easy club to get into. Some of the work that he does is world class. My personal experience with him has always been just, I walk away feeling like, oh my goodness, I should see the world through his lens more often. So now he works for NPCA, which means he has not much time for anything else, uh, but he does volunteer his time and his photo work for campaigns that are dedicated to protecting sensitive lands and species especially the greatly misunderstood arid lands of the Southwest. So we're just tickled to death to welcome him from the desert to 91 degrees of humidity. <laughs> and I'll turn the microphone over to him now. Thank you. I was in Death Valley 
and my chemicals boil. <laughs> Something that occurs to me, and that occurred to me while Philip was speaking, was that <clears throat> when you see an Ansel Adams photo, and you think when we, you know, when we talk about the most famous nature photographers of all time, of people who kind of describe through photography the elements of the world and the intense popularity. You, I always wonder, why is it that everybody cares? What is it about that that makes everybody care and connect to that photo? And in my mind, it's, I think it's that we remember, when we see these photos on a very subconscious level, we remember that we are of the earth and from the earth. And perhaps that we miss it at some level. And, you know, my love and career is advocacy, and from my perspective, what advocacy is, is when that feeling that you have when you see an Ansel Adams photo, when you take the initiative to use that feeling in a way where you say, this is something that I love, and I refuse to let anything happen to this place or this animal that I love. Ansel Adams is, you know, incredibly famous photographer who, you know, he, he was a technical master. He was not only a photographer, but he was a person who helped develop autofocus systems for cameras. So he was to that level of understanding and detail. But his other contributions were related to this thing called biocentric management. And after his work in Yosemite, and he really started to see, you know, people coming into Yosemite, he actually, as Phil mentioned, started leading the charge for the creation of a new kind of paradigm in national parks and stuff. So not only did he work to help create national parks, but then he understood that there was an opportunity to shift how those parks were managed. And he led the charge in the creation of of, Kings Can of uh, Sequoia and Kings Canyon to really create a wilderness-focused experience in those national parks. And one other thing I wanted to say is that I'm lucky because I get to share space, although not time, with Adams. And I'm really privileged to be able to work to try to protect some of the places that he loved so dearly. I, I came to this work and I came to conservation in as different of a way as you could imagine than he did. I don't know if folks know this Catlin work, but Catlin, um, this was actually, it showed here recently. Philip, do you, do you know, remember how long ago it showed? A year ago. About a year ago it was showing here. And the reason I wanted to show you the Catlin photo is for a couple of reasons. One is just to think about the fact that art and artists have always served as catalysts for social change. Catlin was one of the first folks, that, at least that we have record of, who really were advocating for the idea of a national park system, although he had some different ideas about what that might be. But this painting, <coughs> is incredibly well respected, it's renowned. And what I want to talk about is the implicit bias that people have when thinking about art and thinking about painting as art, thinking about sculpture as art, and then that that feeling does not extend necessarily to photography. I think that oftentimes people think that photography is in fact a lesser, less skillful, um, form of art, medium of art. And it's not for me to decide whether or not that's true. What I want to talk to you about is impact. And there's something about photography that allows folks, that kind of penetrates people's kind of preconceived notions about themselves and others and conditions, 
and to allow people to share experiences in an incredibly powerful way. If you think about the revolution that's happening with just how people share photographs now, that there are entire forms of social media that are based solely on photography, the opportunity to communicate through photography is profound. Adams, I think, is most strongly associated with the Sierra Nevada. And the Sierra Nevada and its beautiful 14,000 foot peaks, um, known as the Range of Life, are in fact the rain shadow that have created the California desert. So it is in the height and beauty and that on one side, the moisture creates the world's greatest trees. And the lack of moisture has created one of the most beautiful deserts on the planet. He was led down those steep mountains by Edward Weston and found himself transfixed by the beauty of the California desert as well. As you can see, this is one of his works from Death Valley. The elemental, the elemental nature of the desert allows one to walk on the bones of the earth. and to contemplate time on the weathered face of Earth's clock. This is an Adams photo taken even further south in the California desert. I can, I really can resonate with the timelessness of these landscapes and the feeling that Adams had for these places. I, I understand those feelings. I have those feelings for the California desert. I understand that that the rugged bones of the earth, that that elemental nature communicates something different than any other place in the world. It's a place where people find their spirit. I talked a little bit about the bias of, that photography faces, and yet it has become one of the most powerful forces for conservation. I grew up in the wet tropics of South Florida, and I witnessed Clyde Butcher's work literally redefine the popular perception of the value of the eerily beautiful swampland. Butcher's images help protect globally important wetlands in Southwest Florida by showing the world that the swamps are cathedrals of light and life rather than wastelands. This perception is one that we are working desperately hard to shape in the California desert. In addition to environmental change, photography forces us to confront the world around us in a way that stirs our spirit. Kevin Carter's image is perhaps one of the most impactful photos ever taken. It shapes us to our core, and it makes us question our very humanity. Believe it or not, Kevin Carter took his life after receiving acclaim for his work on band. And in thinking of the power of photography, Lee Jeffrey's portraits of homelessness across the world similarly, similarly stir our souls. We wonder about the lives and hardships these people are enduring. We're forced to face these people and their situations. It causes us to reflect on our lives and our role as part of the world around us. What do we value? What will we allow others around us to endure? This emotion is put forth in a hauntingly, eerily beautiful photograph. One of the most creative and dynamic environmental campaigns I've ever witnessed is a, re a relatively recent campaign by Nick Brandt. Um, he printed life-size photos of animals returned to places they were dispossessed from. To juxtapose the place, the squalor, and to allow people to remember what it was that it was once a wild place, lorded over by lions, is an evocative action, discussing what progress is, and about remembering where we came from, and what costs were born to get to where we are.
I'm now going to move into some of my photos. <laughs> this is a photo of the Redwoods, and in per perhaps the most, maybe the most successful environmental campaign that ever happened was that to save the Redwoods. And that campaign, and those images of the Redwoods, if you talk about, I think Philip spoke about how when you go to Yosemite, you are walking on a photo trail of the images that you saw at Adam's Trunk. The, I think for so many folks, the idea of what, what their heaven is or what their idyllic place is, if, you, if you're having a hard day at work and you gotta close your eyes and go to a happy place, <laughs> which happens sometimes, <laughs> for so many people, that, that is the Redwoods. And it is because of this campaign where there is a rhododendron and a creek and giant trees. And that was the success of that campaign to, to show everybody, to actually redefine for some people what beauty was and what value was. That's how intense that campaign was. <coughs> Death Valley National Park is 30 times less rain than Redwood. <laughs> and it is, in fact, because of the mountains that Adam loves so. This is a photo that I took of uh, the Ibex dunes. Um, the photo for me is textural, it's sensual, it's beautiful. It's something that people don't always get to see, is what a dune system looks like after a heavy rain. And there are places on those dunes where, after a heavy enough rain, that you'll actually see streams of water running down the sand dunes, if you can imagine. This is a photo of the texture of the of small, uh, just of one meter of a sand dune system. The, these sculpted lines at the top, the ridges had dried before the valleys, we're talking about a quarter of an inch difference. And what really kind of blew my mind about it was that even in that micro world, the sand dune system, had the detail had taken on the shape and character of the sand dunes themselves. As you move kind of further east into the Mojave, you start getting more rain, and you start getting lusher environments, and you get places like Mojave National Preserve, which is a uh, national preserve that was created in 1994. Um, the geologic wonder to have a landscape that's so dynamic with lava tubes and sand dune systems and giant mountains to walk, if, you, if we could have the privilege of watching a slow motion video of thousands of years happening in the California desert, it would be an action film, and hopefully Nicholas Cage would not be in it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to Nicholas Cage if you're in the audience. <laughs> this is Big Cypress National, National Preserve. It's part of South Florida's watery heart, in a place of equal parts beauty and difficulty. The moss, orchids, and tree frogs have learned to live above the water line. It was a place I read about but didn't get to visit until college. I grew up in a rough immigrant community in South Florida and was responsible for finding an American dream that brought my people across the ocean. Despite my interest in nature and my obsession with wildlife, I couldn't have predicted how profoundly they would shape and improve my life. Did I get to live a life fighting for the last, life, the last vestiges of America's wild heritage? and to be able to take care of my mother and my family doing so. Did I be able to show people what I love and that they would love it too? And that they would walk with me to help make it real? That while I could never be an Adams or a Butcher or a Brandt, that I had been awoken into a, tr a tradition and that people were hungry to reconnect with their older selves as stewards and in better alliance and attunement to the world around them. The photos, show, the photos show us that the world around us exists and forces us to choose the world we want to live in. We are jarred from complacency. <laughs> 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 
my true love in photography is why I like photography. And um, when I grew up and how I grew up, I really didn't have any idea that I would finish high school, let alone uh, have the opportunity to see some of the most incredible places and creatures on the planet. And nor would I ever have the ability at that time to understand the richness and value that it would add to my life. When I got to Katmai National Park and I was able to watch bears for five days of my life and photograph them for 14 hours a day, I realized something, which was that bears are very much like dogs. And that bears and dogs came from a similar ancestor. And watching bears interact gave me insight into not just the present and the spirit of what's wild, but also into the nature of time itself and where things came from and where behaviors come from. You know, as I edit my photos and a small dog lays on my lap, I think of these giant brown bears. I went on an expedition, if that's what you could call, um, hiking around stupidly and looking for musk ox. <laughs> <laughs> both, both my girlfriend and I are um, really serious nature photographers and we went looking for the musk ox and we found them near gates of the Arctic National Park in Alaska. And there were, at one time in the Pleistocene, there were four species of musk ox. Uh, there's only one left. It's only found in the polar regions. and. It's a remarkable and strange animal, and that animal, for defense, it, it will put its, all of its calves in the middle of a circle and will circle up, horns out. And that's what they'll do to defend themselves from bears and from wolves. They didn't do that to me. Um, I had been working out, but... <laughs> This photo shows, it's a long exposure photo of a Southeast Alaskan salmon run. And this photo was taken to show the energy expended by the fish, driven by the, the sole purpose of completing their cycle, cycle of life by breeding where they were born. The salmon themselves return sustenance to the land. Uh, it adds a dimension of richness because if you think about it, salmon take resources from the sea, bring those resources back to the land to add to the richness of the land itself. And it's an incredible pattern that's happened for you know, many thousands, if not millions of years. This is a black hockey ball, and I put this photo in because I just wanted to say that the export, so we have talked about the beauty, value, richness of national parks, but it's also important to understand that the exportation of the model of national parks, the fact that that mantle was picked up and carried to other places, has become the saving grace for species across the world. And I found, I had met this hawk eagle in Panama. Uh, this hawk eagle doesn't eat people, but it does eat primates. It's actually an eagle that grabs monkeys out of trees and eats them. But to think that across this world, uh, and in a time when I think we hear so many stories about what we're losing every single day, to think that we live in a world where we still have tigers and gorillas, a wild world that we can still protect, and that the American idea of national parks is the one, probably one of the formative aspects of that opportunity. And that had that not occurred, that opportunity may not exist. This is a jaguar that I met in the Brazilian Pantanal. So it's, it's the biggest jaguar subspecies and the largest wetland in the world. Um, I like this photo for one reason. I never, I don't know if it's true, I, I gotta actually think about this, but I don't think I have never been so scared and fallen in love at the same time. <laughs> this big cat lives in the Brazilian continental because of the protection.
section of the national parks that were created in Brazil. This is a thorny devil, which is the analog, Western Australian analog, to America's horned lizard. It's a, if you were living in a macro world, this would be a monster. I wanted to walk you guys through a little bit of my journey and a little bit about the photography that I have done, especially that wildlife photography, for the simple reason that I want to communicate that photography has been a core component of the political campaigns that I've managed over the last eight years in the California desert. However, nowhere was it more impactful, meaningful, or needed than in the recent designate to the, the recent campaign to designate 1.8 million acres in the California desert as a national monument. In February 2016, President Obama signed into law these three national monuments one of the largest conservation actions in U.S. history, and connected protected, protected, connected protected desert lands together to create one of the greatest continuous desert reserves on planet Earth. Due to the fact that these lands were remote, rarely visited, photography was a core element to gaining support, traction, and political buy-in. Photography created the image and brand of these lands, this political effort and the opportunity to protect the larger landscape. NPCA's photos were even used on the White House blog to celebrate the new designation. So let me just show you. That's Castle, that's Castle Mountain, Mojave Trails National Monument, which is a 1.6 million acre national monument. Sand and Snow National Monument, all. I'll show you them. This is Mojave Nash Trails National Monument from the air. This is a geological landscape that includes volcanoes, lava flows, sand dunes, dry leaf beds, and dozens of mountain ranges that extend. They're six, seven thousand feet tall, but they extend prominently. 5,500 feet in some places, straight up from the ground level. This national monument effectively connects Joshua Tree National Park and Mojave National Preserve together through conservation. That national monument includes hundreds of thousands of acres of critical habitat for the desert tortoise. This species has, has declined dramatically over the past uh, 25 years, and the rough estimate number is that the population has dwindled by 90% in the last 20 years. This See America poster was created using a composite of my photos to celebrate the designation of NPS unit number 410, Castle Mountain. This landscape was threatened by mining and it was excluded from conservation in 1994 when Mojave National Preserve was created uh, due to political interests. And we were incredibly fearful that if we weren't able to protect it this year, that that landscape was gonna be industrialized. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of this place, but it's one of the truly special places in the world, and I'm so thankful to let you all know that it is now your newest, your newest national park unit. So Castle represents the eastern terminus of the world's largest Joshua tree forest. It has, two, it has a migratory and a resident herd of bighorn sheep, and it's critical habitat. And what the sheep in this area do is they, they move from mountain range to mountain range. There are some mountain ranges that have springs, some that don't. There are places that, because they don't have springs, are much safer to land, because there's not the same population of mountain lions, which are the primary predators of the bighorn sheep in the California desert. And they move and they migrate across the landscape in this place as they have for thousands of years. And the protection of these ancestral landscapes and these migratory patterns, something that's incredibly important and the science that we're really just getting to, we're just starting to understand. It's the most beautiful and the largest intact grassland.
in the Mojave Desert. It also includes the natural connectivity, but also the cultural connectivity. Castle Mountains looks over uh, Spirit Mountain, which is in Lake Mead National Recreation Area. And Spirit Mountain is one of the most significant cultural sites in the entire American Southwest. Spirit Mountain is a place where no less than eight Native American tribes that primarily live along the Colorado River and into the Grand Canyon believe that the world started. I talk to you guys about the past and I talk to you about some of the work that I'm doing in the present and I want to talk to you just a little bit about the future. Photography and conservation were powerful tools of empowerment for me and my family. I was fortunate enough to develop a program teaching those skills to high school students in the California desert. We gave them cameras, keep, took them on two years of field trips throughout the desert, and wrote and published a conservation book about the desert tortoise featuring their photos. After several years of additional fundraising, we were able to publish the book in Spanish language. Instead of telling the students what to do or how to feel, we asked them to have experiences and to share their perspectives with others. The students became remarkable photographers and many continue to work to support conservation efforts, both through advocacy and through photography. Despite living in a landscape with one quarter of all national park land in the lower 48 states, none of the students in the program had ever visited the national park before. When they saw Joshua Tree for the first time, they were angry that they didn't know about this part of their backyard. They developed pride in their desert home. When they went to Sequoia, they continued to ask if each tree was a Sequoia. When they finally saw one, they were silent. And they were physically moved by the greatness of that tree. Some to tears, although they had something in their eye and they didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> Like Adams in reverse, those photographers little by little came to value these places as much for their very existence as they did for their value to them. They understood that a world with living desert, curious tortoises, and giant trees was richer and heavier and more worth being in. Our female students met female Park Service wildlife biologists. They understood that that path was open to them if they wanted it. None of the females in my program knew that they could be biologists if they wanted to be. And as simple as that is, to me, that's a great accomplishment of the program itself. The students became published authors, photographers, all while in high school. It was a product and a story they got to carry forward in life, wherever it was taken them. They also held an art exhibit, presented to groups, were featured in media and magazines, and held book signings. I'm going to try to read this, but I had a student, her name was Kia Kaysen. She was interviewed by the LA Times about the program. And I, her words were so beautiful, I, I just want to read them to you. I have greater respect for tortoises now that I've seen up close how they live their lives, said Kia Kaysman, a junior at Victor Valley High School and an aspiring photographer. I'll never go into the desert again with the mind that I had when I started the program, she said. I always thought the desert was just heat and dirt. Now I see how beautiful its plants, creatures, and landscapes really are. The colors of the sky in the day and at night. The way the Joshua trees bend in the wind. The, intel the intelligence and vulnerability of tortoises. All tell stories that give the desert character and make you wonder. After this, after she was interviewed by the LA Times, the reporter called me back and said, if you don't hire her, I will. <laughs> <laughs> One of my students, 
cared so deeply about desert conservation and about making a difference that he asked me to take him to Washington, D.C. to lobby on desert issues, and so that he could share the book with legislators. Lucas had never been on a plane before, and he would hate me telling this story. Um, he was so scared that he held my hand <laughs> on the whole plane ride. A couple of hours, this, this kid had never been on a plane before. A couple hours later, he's in a meeting room, meeting with Senator Feinstein. Um, and I was really worried for him because he was so nervous. And it's like something happened. She walked in the room, boom, he turned on. Click. And he was a mighty lobbyist. So mighty that he had the senator go back three separate times to get gifts for him and his family. <laughs> <laughs> I've never but nothing. One of the gifts that the senator gave Lucas was a tie for his grandfather, who was Senator Feinstein's biggest fan. And Lucas's grandfather recently passed away and one of his last wishes was to be buried in the tie. And that's how proud his family was of him. Um, and so, and how proud they were of the work he was doing to try to protect the desert. His family had been in the desert before there was the United States. They were, they were of the desert and from the desert and they loved the desert. I'm just going to take you through a couple of quotes before I end. I'm just going to take you through a couple of the photos that the students took uh, during the project. This is a black and white photo by Lucas. He worked for the BLM for a while, the Bureau of Land Management, which is a federal agency that owns probably more federal land than any other land management agency in the country. He's now at Humboldt State University studying biology and developing his skills as both a writer and photographer. And he's become a really excellent writer as well. This is his photo of a desert tarantula, <coughs> taken with a wide-angle lens, which meant that he was this close. <laughs> and that's why this. This is Wyatt Myers' photo of a desert tortoise on the moon. <laughs> Tortoises don't like being stereotyped. <laughs> leave you with uh, Marcus Estebani's beautiful photo of the serrated leaves of a Joshua tree. Uh, thank you all so much. It's an online, crowdsourced, 
non-jury National Park and Love campaign. Anybody can contribute artwork that they have developed either through photography, painting, just all kinds of really neat, neat things are happening with this. And we want people to think about having this in their homes, sharing it with their friends. This is designed to take art and engage new audiences, remind people of great places they've visited, or more importantly, the places that are on their bucket list. And you're gonna find more places for that bucket list, let me tell you. So, Phil and uh, David, and we'll just, we're running a little long. I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, and we'll take a few questions, and then we'll have the prize portion of our program. Thank you. So, the way this is gonna work, raise your hand, I'll call on you. If you'll stand up, say your question. I'll repeat the questions, make sure everyone can hear. And then we'll have a little bit of discussion. So, who would like to be first? The lady back there. I would like to ask if you're able to continue your program with the students. So, she'd like to know, were you able, or will you be able to continue the program with your students? That's a great question. It's so old school. I need to use a regular microphone. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, we've thought about how ways to duplicate that project, but what I really want to happen is that there being a passing of the torch, and what I'd really like to do is to help one of the students that participated in that program hold the program again. So I'd like to help raise funds, provide structure, provide guidance, but to allow somebody else to take the ownership and leadership of that, to build those skills and to have that experience. Gentlemen on the end. Uh, David, um, we took a tour of the Western Park this past uh, fall, and we continue to hear uh, input from the park officials about the uh, cutbacks in funds uh, and the uh, elimination of uh, positions, uh, personnel in the parks, uh, early closings, uh, shorter opening periods. What, what does that mean? Um, look like on the horizon as far as funding. So the, the picture, we're not where we need to be. Um, the last appropriations bill had some funding for parks. So we were at a point where, you know, parks shut down and after that occurred in that, in that austere financial environment, places like Mojave National Preserve were unable to fully staff their visitor center. So they actually cut down the hours. So if you could imagine the experience of a person, you know, taking a trip of a lifetime. And in the California desert, about 30% of our visitors are international. So maybe somebody has saved up their whole life to go to visit those national parks. And you get there to plan your trip. You go to the, you go to the visitor center and it's closed and what that feels like. So those hurt, it, it really hurts. And it means that you don't have the same number of rangers giving programs to students, the same amount of rangers in those classrooms, talking to those students about these resources and why they matter and what their opportunities are, telling the story to those students so that they understand that the parks actually belong to them, giving them that ownership that they need. So those, the hurt is real, you know? whether it's on the interpretive side, on the ability to manage resources side. You know, we've seen a serious uptick in vandalism in Joshua Tree National Park, where there's been all this graffiti. And it's part of that is just, there's just not the staff power because there's not the money to have the rangers be where they need to be, but it's also on the interpretation side where folks are not seeing their rangers, talking to them and understanding the value of these resources. So. Those are some examples, and you know, there are so many things that you can do to protect the parks, but in terms of asking your Congress members to do the right thing by national parks, it's, it's a no-brainer. We did polling, and the polling said that there's something like 95%, is that, is that number right? 95, 
95% of Americans support national parks. Yes. From my perspective, it's almost criminal that we wouldn't do the right thing and fund our national parks. But, and I think reminding, reminding those who represent us that their responsibility is to, to keep their word and to keep our word, that promise that we made so long ago, I, I think that's one of the fundamental asks that we can make. And if I might add, parks get 60 cents of every dollar that they need. Most parks are working with a half set, set of staff. We're loving these parks to death, and the appropriations process requires a lot of intense work. Every dollar that goes into the National Park budget returns 10 to 50 in the gateway communities. The parks are economic generators. They contribute to the quality of life. They are the special places and the remaining green spots, and the importance of them can't be overstated. The most powerful picture you can take is of your family or a friend enjoying the park. Send it to your elected officials and tell them these are important to us. Next question, Mary English. Uh, this question is for either or both of you because it's got an aesthetic component as well as a, I guess, quasi-practical component. Um, having seen all the beautiful photographs, yours, David, and also all the others, can, do you think that somebody can experience a park without going there through the visual eye? And going back to Tracy's point, uh, you're not loving them to death if you do that, if you stay at home. Um, you also are not contributing to climate change by getting there. But uh, your thoughts on the extent to which you can. And for the purpose of our recording, can people experience national parks just through photographs and not, and not visiting them in a meaningful way? I had to paraphrase that. But let you all say it just, but yeah. Oh, okay. So. Well, I haven't been to the parts of California that David showed us, but I felt those places through so many senses. The image of this of the dunes yeah. felt like skin and like wood and hot and cold at the same time. Um, the really lofty and beautiful way that, that David expressed what photography does, um, making making the world feel heavier, richer, more worth living on. Um, I was feeling that through, through, through this, the landscape that you showed, so I know that it's, it's, it's surely possible. Um, Adams, in his case, did want people to have some personal experience in nature, felt that that was essential um, to, to tip them to, to vote the right way. And then, um, but, but the sort of empathy that comes through in a photographer like, like David's, that it's, it's not just, um, think about, the old poems about war, they're all about heroes and gods. And then Shakespeare made us think about the common foot soldier. And Thomas Hardy took it even further to think about the animals that get trod underfoot and under the, the wagons as they roll. I think about the, the, with, with what we saw today. It wasn't just these unique mountains or even the weather that Ansel Adams photographed, but, but sympathy for the smallest creatures, the landscapes that aren't considered beautiful at first until we think about the connectivity and until we get to the eye, the photographer taking us there. So, like, I guess first thing I'd say is that's a, that's a great question. So, and I guess my answer would be, at least my perspective is, so a photo is a, a recounting, a story, a moment, an experience, a feeling, and that can be shared. So you can share a story, and many great stories have been shared over time, and they've shaped the way we live on the world. The power of the stories that have been told shape the way we live on this planet Earth. There's a difference between hearing about something or experiencing something secondhand and experiencing it yourself. And to, I think, I really enjoy that space, the space between those things, where 
I can learn about things, I can know about things, I can hear about them. Never had Ansel Adams experience in the Sierra or in the California desert, but I understand that the one that he had was profound, and that profound experience that he had changed the way the whole world looks at that place. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question. Gentlemen in the gray shirt. You mentioned uh, the Bureau of Land Management and their role as 